Hey, welcome. This is uh, Building SaaS with Python and Django. My name is Matt Lehman. I'm your streamer. I'm a longtime Python software developer, and uh, this stream is all about teaching people how to make Django applications, how to integrate them into stuff that goes on the internet. Um, so we're going to do that kind of stuff tonight. Um, if uh, you're joining me for the first time and you want to you like what you see later on, um, please encourage you to follow on Twitch or if you're on YouTube catching this recording later, um, subscribe if you can. That helps me out um, to get it to other people. Um, I'm going to drop in some notes about what we're going to work on tonight, but we're, we're just going to jump right into it. I do have a chat open. It's, um, it's open for everybody. Just please be civil if you can. Um, specifically this evening, we're going to get back to this Shiv app that I was building. So the, the site that we're working on is uh, called College Conductor. And again, for the details, for the specifics of this particular stream, what College Conductor is all about is not all that important. Just know that it's up online and it's available um, and it's a software as a service. Um, what we're, we've been doing for the last few streams is trying to make the deployment of College Conductor a lot easier. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, kind of outline what that's been looking like and then we'll dive into the little, the actual bits of what we care about. Um, just so people have a note of what we're working on. Um, so let's see, ask me anything about uh, Python or Django. And uh, this is what we're working on tonight. So I use GitHub. GitHub is uh, where all the code is, where it's where all the issues go. I use the issues to help keep track of like what's going on. Um, so we're gonna work straight from there. And uh, but before we dig in, let's let's take let's step back a little bit to talk about what I've been doing. So um, the way that the stuff gets deployed to um, my site right now, uh, the the app gets deployed to the site, is um, by um, using Ansible, which is a deployment tool. Ansible uh, does an SSH connection to my server and does all the commands to configure the server, to run a web server, to run, um, to run, you know, like firewalls and open ports and all this other stuff. And part of that process is like, is putting the actual Python code and running that as the application server uh, on there. Uh, but it is in the past, it's meant um, putting, uh, doing like a git clone and pulling down code and restarting stuff from there. And, um, what that means is there's a lot of stuff, extra stuff that goes on in deployment that, that make one makes deployment longer. So there's a greater chance of, of downtime. There's a higher possibility of risk in, in that. Um, but uh, it also means that there's more tools that have to be installed on the server. And I, I don't want those tools to be installed on the server because I, I want ideally one uh, simple thing that I put out there and say go and it will just run and everything will serve. That's the objective. Uh, and in order to do that, we're using a tool called Shiv. Shiv is from LinkedIn, and it is a uh, designed to bundle up your Python code and bundle up your uh, any third-party packages you have. The most obvious example for, for us is uh, Django itself, um, and put them all into one zip archive. And from that zip archive, we can then execute, and it has, um, we embed the gunicorn web server inside of that thing so really like everything in one place and what that will enable unlock for us uh, on on this project is the deployment um, pipeline will look something like this it it will uh, create the zip archive uh, in continuous integration and store it in s3 and then during deployment we will pull that down uh, pull down a single file and tell the deployment to run that file. That's that's the short version of what's going on. Um, to get there has been a bit of a process. We've we've used the last few streams to like build out the actual uh, zip app and put it up on S3 and pull it down. And so now the kind of we're at the fit and finish sort of stages of this. So uh, we've proven out that that we can make the whole pipeline. We can actually get the artifact there, and uh, we just want to confirm that it's actually going to work in the target environment. And the the unknowns in this, and like the reason why it's, it's not even a certainty yet, 
is because what gets built in continuous integration uh, could be slightly different from the actual uh, deployment server. And if there are, let's say, like binary incompatibilities, um, it, it, it just may not, may not work for a variety of reasons. Um, so I, I, I have no reason to think that it won't work. I mean, the, the CI system is pretty similar to the, build, to the actual server, um, but, but we won't know unless we try. And so I'm not going to actually commit to switching the whole deployment process over to this new method until I have been able to kick the tires and, and see that, that it is uh, working the way we want to. So how should we start? I think I've got, um, I've got the code up here. Uh, and this is this is just all the code, but it doesn't. What we really need to do is get into the um, get into the staging server that I have, and uh, to do that, I'm using Vagrant. Vagrant is a virtual machine that is running my code in an Ubuntu virtual machine on my um, uh, desktop, so that I can simulate what it's like to be on the real server. And I'm going to come over here. I've got Hugo running for some reason. I'm going to kill that for now, just so it doesn't mysteriously conflict with anything that's going on. So Vagrant's going to start up. And last time, we even got as far as pulling, doing like a deployment on this and getting a file um, at the, onto the virtual machine that, that we can then use. And so what we need to do is um, make sure that that thing runs. Um, so how can we do that? Let's let's get on the box, and it might take me a minute, a little while to to get back up to speed. It's been a few weeks since I've been able to stream, um, just because of the traveling and all sorts of stuff. So you'll kind of have to. I'll, I'll be getting up to speed with you as as a learner to see what's going on. Okay. So I know that I put the the apps in this apps directory and serve. Um, so we should be able to go in there and we kind of, there, there were a couple things that we changed last time that's, that sort of hacked, hacked this together. One thing was settings. So if, uh, if we're out, outside, I'm now in a different terminal tab and we're outside the virtual machine. The way that this project was initially structured, as I mentioned, was that the deployment would do a git clone and pull down all this code. And a part of that was that the structure of the actual repository um, dictated whether this was going to work or not. And so the, the key thing that made this work is that conductor and settings both lived at the same directory so that they would both be on the, the Python path. Um, this was important um, because at the startup time of the app, uh, the code needs to be able to see the settings module that's in here. And this is a Django settings module. I guess I should clarify what, I'm, what, what the heck I'm talking about. So all of the, the Django settings are in here. And that's what Django needs in order to operate. These are just like, you know, these are junk settings. I'm not spoiling the world here. The, these get configured differently to, during deployment. So <clears throat> one of the prerequisites to, to making this all work is to have at where the apps are, the settings need to live next to it. Uh, and in order to to even attempt this, um, I, I just took the settings that are still in this clone on this virtual machine and just copied them here just to kind of test it out. Um, and the other thing that we had to do is set this PYZ file as an executable. So Let's bring up the history because I think there's some other stuff that went in here. Um, hopefully history has recorded this. Do, do, do. Maybe not. Um, so, okay. I think above if, what I'm looking for right now is the Django settings module. Settings module will is, is a string path that when Django boots up through the web, web server, it will inspect for an environment variable called Django settings module. And based on that string value, it's supposed to be a Python module path. It will look um, 
for what's available and try and load the settings from there. Uh, but you have to have it defined um, in order to run that. So I can do that by going above and I put this environment file here that um, I don't, I've got to be careful. I don't want to dump out a bunch of like passwords and stuff that might happen to be on here. So um, we're going to just pipe to grip so that we don't see everything. Okay. So cool. This is what, what we want. So this is saying now <clears throat> when we start up this Shiv app, uh, since the Django settings mo module is now set and exported in the environment, um, the, the Shiv app should run the way we would think it would run. So let's try it. Let's, um, it, it, it's a matter of running that file as an executable. So this should start up if we're all, if we're lucky. <clears throat> okay. And I think this is about how far I got last time and then had to quit. Like it was, I was a uh, yay successful. It, it worked, but uh, didn't actually dig into how well is it working. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is you'll notice that uh, we're running this at port 8000. Um, that is a different port from where we can actually see our staging site. So if I come over here and bring up the um, test path, like this loaded, but that what's loading and running right, right now is not the conductor, um, not that conductor app file, because that's... Um, I'm like, how can I say this well? That is what's plugged into Nginx. Overall architecture of this thing is there's a an Nginx load balancer at the top. It's handling all incoming traffic. And part of what that traffic handling is doing is if there are static files like JavaScript or CSS files, it serves those up. Nginx is very efficient at serving up static files very quickly because it uses certain uh, operating system calls to make that happen. Um, and then if the route looks like something that is not a static file, it passes things on to a web server. Um, and uh, currently the, the web server that's there is part of the Ansible, deplo Ansible deployment stuff. So if we go down into playbooks, web, uh, templates, you can see here that there's this WSGI um, web server that's running. And so that's what's, that's actually running right now. When we're, when we're going to www.conductor.test, something I overrode in my Etsy host file so that it's, it's not going out to the internet, this is actually coming straight to my virtual machine. Um, so it's serving from that Nginx, which is then going to uWSGI. What we need to do to really validate this is um, come in through a, a different port, but I want to say that if I just try to put on port 8000, we're not going to get anything. Um, because that port is not open to um, Vagrant, is my belief. Yeah, it's not, it's, you probably actually, I realize there's a bar above this. This thing is just spinning here. That My browser is saying it, it can't find it. So I'm going to uh, give up on that request and we will configure Vagrant so that it can open that up. And once we have got it open, we can then try reaching it at port 8000 and see how it goes. We might have some other issues here because the other thing to note is this is serving over HTTP um, and the stuff that uh, it needs to serve over HTTPS and I think there are some settings in Django that will complain and blow up if we don't. So there's a bit of work to do to, to get that going. And then the goal is to validate that, to validate that it works. And then the next part of this is to come back to this issue over here in GitHub um, and then actually configure Ansible to do these things that, that get it to like the, the hacked up version that I made right now. Uh, and after, after it's hacked up, uh, then I can start working out a scheme to um, uh, migrate some stuff over. There's a bunch of other pieces in place here that, that I want to do to make this pretty seamless for each time. So we've got some, we've got some work cut out for us. 
So let's look at the Vagrant file. And the Vagrant file is configured to be a private network at 10.1.2.3. Um, maybe, all right, I'm thinking about this more and more, I'm trying to think about what is actually going on here. The, this is a staging site, it's meant to mimic production as, as much as possible. Part of the production configuration is a firewall, and the firewall is to protect the server as much as reasonable to um, inform that um, no other bad guys can get in there <laughs> except on the designated ports. One of those ports is port uh, 443 for TLS stuff, the other is port 80, and everything else I believe is closed. So when we were trying over here to hit port 8000 um, in the URL that you may not be able to see, I was going to conductor.test colon 8000. Um, what was probably happening is this is resolving to 10.1.2.3, which is a local network that is matches up with a virtual machine. And then the request was getting to the server, but because the port was closed, um, it's just not responding. It's not, not doing anything. So I think what we need to do is open up that port. Um, so how can we do that? Can we do that without committing code? I think we can. So we're going to go back into the playbooks and we're going to go back to that web area. And there's a task in here. One of these tasks should be to, um, let's see, is there a firewall? Firewall is enabled. Um, where's four four? Now we're gonna have to find the port. <laughs> oh, oh, here it is, right here. Um, so it's it's listed at the as the using the naming named alias so http is conventionally port 80 um, ssh is 23 and there's should be another port later on for um, tls or they might call it um, gosh it's so been so long since i've called it anything but tls that i'm just totally spacing on the other name https is, is what i'm going for but um, I don't know where it is. So we need to permit on port 8000 if we want to try this, or another way we could do this that might not re require a deploy is to stop engine X and then run um, that conductor app on port 80. That's probably simpler. So let's, let's attempt that first. Um, uh, So we need to figure out how to set G Unicorn to use a different port and turn off Nginx. So step one is to turn off the service, um, Nginx stop. So now if we come over here and try and hit it again, um, yeah, unable to connect. Good. Nginx is now down. So that's, that's exactly what we want. And then we can go to the find some G unicorn settings and find which setting it is to get the port. Looks like we specify the conductor main. Oh, that's not it. Um, where'd you go? There is a main main. Okay. That seems right. Oh, I didn't put any G unicorn settings in here. Okay. 
Let's find the port. Where are you? Find. Okay. So we give it a form like this, and it will change it. So we want to, instead of running, like look at, check this out. It's it's running at uh, localhost. That's 127.0.0.1. So that is considered the, the loopback address. So in other words, um, it's not going outside of this machine. So it's only listening internal to this machine. So in order to run this the way, way we really want to run it, we need to give it um, an address on the broadcast address. I, I don't know if that's the actual right name, although that's ringing a bell. And for this first time, we'll say bind, and the broadcast address is uh, 0, dot zero dot zero dot zero and we'll say we'll put on 8080 just to see if I got this right um whoops so I didn't put the format right so maybe we don't need the HTTP in front of it okay so now it's listening on 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 at port 8080. That's good news. Um, and maybe test that out. Um, let's go back into the box from a different terminal. And it's curl installed. Good. Curl. So I'm just going to, I'm basically asking for. The data. Oh, bad request. Well, something's not right. Ah, zero dot zero dot zero dot zero is not part of allowed hosts. Okay. So this is this is the stuff that we're gonna shake out of this process. Or I might be creating more problems for myself by um, not going through deploy. Maybe I'm making this slower than it needs to be. That's possible too. So what is the allowed host? Hmm. We are on that box already. Let's go into the apps area and look at settings. Allowed hosts is a list of, so it's coming from something else. So it's not an environment variable though. Well, shoot. I think it might be in one of the secret files. So I'm going to cover this up for a second because I don't know what secrets are in the staging settings. Um, let's see if I got this right. Looks like that's covered. Yeah. Cool. And I will uncover that in a second. Um, okay. Conductor test. And yes, there were a bunch of secrets in here, so I'm glad I didn't put that on a stream. Let's turn it back on. There you all are. Um, so let's try this. Let's try changing this. And instead of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, we're going to do conductor test. Oops, it doesn't like that. Oh, fudge. Um, hmm. Just trying to think of the best way to get, get this going. Ah, okay. I'm gonna hack. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the settings and I'm gonna hack in 
again, we're, we're just trying to get this, we're just trying to prove that this is working. So what you can't see, because I'm not showing um, all of these secrets, is I'm adding 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 to allowed hosts. Allowed host is like a security protection um, that Django has. And that makes sure that the requests that you're getting are coming from the right places. It's, it's a useful tool, uh, except when it gets in your way when you're trying to, to hack on stuff. And I'm not hacking like in the, the nefarious sense. I mean hacking in the just trying to get something going, um, in case that's unclear. Okay, so I put 0.0.0.0, .0, .0 into allowed hosts. Now let's come back to that startup that is this. And it's running again. And now that it's running, let's try doing that curl. If we get, oh, now we're getting a 500. Bleh. What's going on? <clears throat> so 500 in is indicative of not good things. Um, we have some logs. They should be, that should be able to help us. So let's look at our log. And in here, it's been a long time since I looked at this log, so let's see if it's in, in here, what happened. Well, that doesn't look right, because that, that's whiskey. So where did that log go? This is the other web server, so this is not not the actual log that we care about. Okay, we will, oh, it dumped it out right here. Cool. Template does not exist. Uh, now we're cooking. That means that it is not finding our template directory. Um, okay. That's actually prom a promising sign. So, in when we built this package, we made it as a um, the the first prerequisite to working with Shiv was you have to um, build a Python package, and part of building a Python package is um, making a setup.py and listing all of the Python files you want to include, but also listing all of the um, all of the template directories and stuff and including that into the package as data so the question is why why can't um why can't it see the template directory that's the real problem um okay to debug that i guess we have to look and make sure that the templates are in fact included into the package. Uh, that's step one. And if they are there, which I think they are, because I think we ran this elsewhere, there's also a need to check um, the template paths that the settings currently has and see if they don't match up. Right. I think that's reasonable. I'm, and I'm guessing it's the latter. Let's stop this. Um, I'm going to a, 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 this PYZ thing, this, this is a zip app, which is, it's in the standard library. It's like there's a whole, there's a pep you can read about what zip apps are. It's a way of bundling Python code up. Um, but uh, uh, it is a zip archive. So we can use the unzip command on it to get out, oops, but except I um, don't have the right permissions, so I gotta use sudo in here. Now, thankfully this is like all just a virtual machine. This, I would not actually do this on, on production. That would be kind of scary. That's why you create separate environments for testing this stuff out. 
uh, because the impl implication of kind of doing this on your live site is, is I hope to a degree, kind of a bad idea. So I dumped, uh, I unzipped everything to here and it put out that looks like previously all we had was this one file and the settings directory and it filled it with this bootstrap directory environment main and site packages the stuff i know for sure certain is in site packages um, so let's let's get in there and let's get into conductor and see Okay, there's templates, and the, the traceback, if you, well, it's way up here now, but uh, traceback was complaining, oh my word, there's a lot of stuff in here, about the index file, and there's so much stuff in here, this is unbelievable, okay, forget it, there's a lot of files in there, I'm not going to scroll back through all that. He was complaining about the, missing the index file. And you can see uh, right here that the index file is there. So that tells me that um, it's not finding the templates directory anymore. So we can figure out what that setting is. And then what's the best way to do that? Now I'm, I'm we're starting to like uns. Unsurface some other problems along the way. One of those problems is we did not give ourselves any way to run manage.py. Um, so it's not it's not as easy to get in here and say what are the settings. Um, so how can we do that? What? Okay. I haven't really changed the template directory settings that I recall. We can look at the code for a minute, but I'm pretty sure they're still the same. I... Yeah, I I can already kind of see the problem right here. So what this is doing currently is looking at um, the current directory of settings and which is what this router is or or I'm sorry router is going up a level and then saying from the directory above me look at my siblings which conductor would be one of them in the repository format and then join it with templates as well that's not where templates are anymore in this new world order, if you will, templates are now buried down here with site packages in this conductor area. Um, it's a, it's extremely interesting. Like I'm actually not sure how the best way to to reference these because this is um, these are things that are Im embedded in this zip app. So even if I was able to say, you know, like right now, if I if I come up here to the site packages area and I start Python, right? Or let's let's make sure we're starting the right version of Python because it's Python three. We should be able to import conductor from here because we're where we started, and it it, it did it. But and the, this, because we extracted it, will all be fine. So you know, it, we know we're in the conductor file, um, and that's the init.py. What we need to be able to say is um, the templates directory is another is another thing in here so we kind of it's almost like we want um and this won't work but i'll, I'll get kind of notionally show it to, to describe my thinking we want something like this 
and, and that doesn't really exist because templates itself is not a package it's just a it's a static set of data within the package so my guess is what's really needed is the package resources so we're gonna have to start poking around the standard library i think or, or look at the shiv documentation for ways to reference static assets so i think ultimately what will need to happen is the settings will need to import the conductor package and in whatever manner you get um, paths to static data directories out of shiv apps or out of zip apps in general um, is the method that we're going to have to supply for that um, template uh, directories setting and that will then expose the, um, the the templates in the proper way i would think and then the instead of getting a 500 error it'll actually find the template and, and load everything appropriately wow that's not what i anticipated doing tonight but hey these are interesting problems that we get into so let's bring up the shiv documentation and see if it mentions we might might i might just get into google searching pretty quickly here so i don't know if they have clear documentation about where this stuff is going to live let's say python shiv package resources is what we're going for i think Maybe let's let's broaden the scope by saying zip app package resources. Because remember, uh, a shiv app is a zip app under the covers. Okay, I, I knew that there was this there was this package resources standard library module. This is probably where we're gonna have to use these things. Um, I don't know how to use it, <laughs> so we shall see if that's the right thing. Package util, what is this? Sometimes you just got to read documentation, as I've said in previous streams. So apologies for the silence. I'm learning as much as you are here. And the interesting part of this is some of these, this documentation seems to point at like specific resources, but really we want like the whole resource directory, which I think is going to be a fascinating part of this. That's weird. Um, maybe it's just a bad link. Package resources. So package resources comes with setup tools. Oh, there is a lot of stuff right here. What this? What is this thing? Package util seems to be, this is standard library documentation. So what is this guy? In path. Hmm. 
Hmm. Bunch of loaders and things of that sort. Okay. Maybe it's this thing, package util, get data. This seems like it's getting the whole resource. I really just want a directory. Let's poke at it, see what it does. So we should be able to import package util and package util get data was the name of the method. Conductor is our package that we care about. Um, and then it's the resource part that I'm struggling with. Like if we if I type in templates, what's it going to do? Yeah, it's a directory. I know. I know it's a directory, guys. That's what I want. <laughs> oh boy. I mean, it, it's kind of telling me we're in the right ballpark, but how do we get? What I don't understand is when zip apps are operating, like where do these files go? Are they running? from uh entirely from that zip app file in memory uh or is there an extracted area that they actually run from uh like in temp or something like that it's, it's not real really clear to me and we might need to get down to reading about zip apps to, to figure that out um So we've got package util. Let's try Python package util get directory. What else could we try? We could try, let's try something even more explicit for our problem. Um, Django zip app templates directory. Who knows, maybe someone has provided, figured out how to do this. Nope. We're at the fringes, everyone. It's <laughs> both good and bad. I tell people constantly that I like Django because it has a, a big eco ecosystem and there's tons of paths that are already like paved over for you. Um, so it makes a lot of this work easy. And what I'm doing here with this Shiv app um, deployment is, is probably a little off the beaten path. Uh, which is why we're we're running into this scenario here. So I don't think anybody, or at least Google has not indexed anybody who's found experienced that problem directly. And what do we do now? Hmm. Uh, what are they saying? trying to find someone who has experienced the same problem of wanting to get a directory out of package resources rather than a particular file. 
I don't know if it doesn't seem like a very common scenario. The other thing that we could check is is like when when the Shiv app runs, where is it running from? Like getting back that, back to that idea of is it running in memory or is it extracting itself somewhere in temp location and then running from there? I think if it is, we might have more hope of kind of just calling on. Um, well, you know what, now that I look at this, sorry, I'm getting derailed in my thought process, but I'm, I'm, I'm mixing things up here because I'm, I'm looking at a site packages thing, but I have to remember I've already unzipped this, which is not how zip apps run. They, uh, extract themselves when they run. So it's, um, what I'm seeing here as this error message of saying, you know, you're looking for this direct this thing that's a directory and here's the path to it. I was actually getting hopeful for a moment that, oh, maybe I can just um, reference the zip app um, and find the file for the conductor package and then do the join from there. And maybe that's still true. Um, so we're we're running out of like ways to speculate about this and i think it's time to to dig in and get some more data and in order to do that i think what i need to do is get the manage shell here and we're, i think to do that well we need to build it into the package um when i started this process i i mentioned i mentioned him a few times there's a uh, peter um Baum Gart Gartner is a DjangoCon presentation that covers um, Shiv, and the speaker notes were somewhere. Maybe they were on his Twitter account. I, I keep referring back to them, um, and I'm doing that because I remember I remember one of the slides he had there. Um, showed how he integrated a manage.py into the package and i think it was gave him uh, a method of calling it from a shiv app so he's he's kind of done a bit of this work with his company um gotta get the right guy i lost it is this him there he is so he has a consultancy called Lincoln Loop that does Django stuff. And thankfully he doesn't tweet super, super often. So <laughs> this thing that we're looking for is right at the top. How convenient. We're gonna poke through here until we find this manage thing. And then I'm going to just take it. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. And I think he also gave like an example of how you use it. So here's here's kind of what we've got here. Like uh, I've got a lot much longer name than my project. It's conductor with a SHA in it, but it's still a PYZ. And he's got the interesting part that I see is he has a run server here, so I'm trying to figure out what he did. So this is this is the point that I was looking for. In the set of a file, he put a, um, a console script. And if you are not familiar with Python packaging, that's a, a feature that's in the setup tools stuff that they call entry points. Entry points are ways to make console scripts. Like when you install your thing, it becomes um, something that's accessible as a like, a, let's say, I don't know, you just did a pip install of a tool like 
uh, black. And after you've installed it, then you have the black command line tool. It's probably a console script uh, that, that is giving you access to that. So what he's done is said, here is the, the core command to execute. And here's the name he wants to give it. So I hopefully, as an example of how he's used it. Ah. Um, no, that's pipm. All right. Because, and this is important too, the more I think about it, because later on, we're going to need to use uh, Django to do migrations as well. And when we strip out the repository, strip out all the other stuff, the only remnant, the only hint of Django that we'll have left is in the zip app. So we need to be able to expose the manage.py interface because that has the migrate command that's actually going to migrate the database. Um, so gotta figure out how to make this work. And I think his line, his line does what, I think we want, but I need to f determine like where, where, how to run it from there. Because I don't, either I'm misunderstanding something about it, or, yeah, well, that's very likely, very likely the case. Because he's got this line of, this this one right here. So run server is a uh, like a subcommand of manage.py, and I am curious of what is connecting the dots here because when I run the uh, pyz um, file, it's running gunicorn directly. So I've configured it differently than the way he configured it, and. I need to reconcile those differences. So let's see if Shiv explains how to do console scripts or multiple things. Because essentially, we're we're now we're aiming for this thing is serving two purposes. On one hand, if you give it um, no parameters or very few parameters, we want it to. Um, run gunicorn. The other way to approach this is I could write a little bit of extra code that looks for a flag that then will toggle between gunicorn and manage.py, but that's starting to get pretty nasty. Um, so I'm hoping that there is a clear way to run other stuff. Like they're giving examples here of wrapping up popular Python packages, like requests, and running it as a single file. And, but it's bringing up the actual um, REPL, read evaluate print loop, to access requests. Which is cool, but not what I'm looking for. Oh, and here we go. When you run an executable created with shiv, a special bootstrap function is called. This is this is the interesting part. The function unpacks dependencies into a uniquely named subdirectory of dot shiv, and then runs your entry point. Okay, so that's that's encouraging because that means when this will run, it's going to put it somewhere that that is unpacked and. Presumably, if we do an import of conductor, uh, the, the dunder file attribute will point somewhere on that temporary, on that shiv path. So that's, that's cool. And I guess these are cached. Um, that's something that would be interesting to watch out for. Although, well, hold on. Any libraries? These are extracted. Oh, yeah, this is exactly the note we're going for. Just read the documentation, Matt. Good grief. 
<laughs> so they're extracted rather than loaded into memory, like I was asking about, um, because of limitations of binary dependencies. Okay, cool. Um, shared objects require a file system, blah, blah, blah. And so I think what they're describing is they, they made a design choice to unpack it for the very reason of um, what we're kind of going for. Of we want files to be in unique places that, or yeah, unique places in the file system that we can expect. Now, still, we still have the question of what, how do we run manage.py? So let's keep reading because maybe, maybe I've missed it. But, and if you're looking, if you're like looking at the side and you're screaming at at me. Um, while you're watching, I have read this one before. This is for like building up the, the G unicorn part of that. I don't remember it saying anything about manage.py. We can take a quick peek at it as a reminder. Uh, oh, oh no, they, they have the run server. So yeah, so they're, they do do what I was thinking about doing, which is uh, toggling between two separate commands based on the presence of a system argument. So, you know, maybe I make the entry point say something like, if system arg is uh, manage, it will pass off to manage.py. That could be one path. And then the rest of the stuff's about building, so. Interesting that they're including manage.py in their package. I don't think I did that. But you don't need it. It's not strictly required. Because let's actually let's open manage.py just to prove it. What manage.py does, the, the default one that's like created when you do a start project is, and I've even extended this a little bit, but I, I want to say that this part of this, you know, well, definitely at this part of this testing thing is something I added. But the default version basically says if your main try to import some default settings and then run the thing with whatever's from the argument system argument list. So we can probably simulate this ourselves in main, which I've created um, over here. And the, the difference being, we would do, what would we do? We could do the, the parsing. So a rough sketch of what this would look like is uh, we've got sys and just like over here where they pull this out. Um, I mean, heck, we could. Wow, we're using a index error. Okay, I I don't like I don't necessarily like the way they did that. But it, whatever, it's fine. So just kind of taking this concept and doing this. And instead of uh, production, we would use like, we'd call it manage. So now we have a flag in here that um, If it's manage, then we want to run the stuff over here. Otherwise, we want to run G unicorn. So I don't. We can probably test that out. See if that's going to be good enough. 
and then okay so now let's let's project ahead a little bit to see what this buys us i think we're gonna have to do, do some fiddling here too because it's we don't want to pass in the whole argv probably because it well maybe but we could probably just play with it and see how it goes um I'm still not crazy about this though, but I'm, I'm just struggling. I'm thinking like, what's the right way to pull from argv? There'll be times where <clears throat> where we don't where we have multiple parameters or all sorts of stuff, and we got to check something. So maybe it's not so bad, and it is kind of relying on the Python philosophy of, um, well, okay, maybe I'm, here's here's what I'm able to identify about it, why I don't like it. It, in the normal case where we'd want to run it as a web server, is running, an ex it's running through the exception stack as a mechanism for control flow. Um, so uh, that's, that's not great, because uh, it's slower. And it slows on startup, and not not a lot. And, and maybe I'm I'm kind of getting a little worked up about something that's minor. Um, but I, I think I would almost rather do this in a way that is um, safer and does a little bit of checking first. So we would say um, if length of sysargv is greater than one, so that that ensures that there's at least two things on it. So we're not going to run into the index error if we do that that checking. Then we want manage to equal, well, we want this line. And then we can say else manage is false. Okay. I think this is the a safer way to do exactly the same thing without exceptions. It does a length check. Um, and then tests against that first argument. Uh, in fact, we could forget the Boolean. Well, no, we can't. I was going to say we could forget the Boolean altogether and then just inline this stuff, but I don't think we can really do that because there's actually two Boolean checks here. This one that's the length and then one of is does the first thing uh, equal manage so let's um let's build this version of the package and try it locally and see if we can get to a shell in with a new package and then deploy that and go through this whole process again Although, yeah, I think we need to go through this whole process again because we need to have the confidence that the thing that um, the package that we pull down uh, onto the staging server uses binary compatible stuff, which is what CI has. If we, if I try to just, for example, SCP a built file here, I'm on Mac OS and um, copying that into the virtual machine, it's the chances of it working are, are pretty slim to none. So let's log out of there. And I think I need to tweak the package script to not look for some certain stuff, like expecting. Yeah, it's expecting certain things. Um, Because on CI, I have a, I have build, I put shiv into a virtual environment named vnv, and locally I don't do that. So this directory is not going to exist. So the easiest way that we can do this for now is to comment it out. Actually, I can make that script smarter in the future if I keep having to mess with the package. Hopefully I won't have to do this very often once we get it everything up and running, which is why I'm kind of opting for a simpler script. Uh, but by doing this, it's now saying this will be an empty path, and I'll just run shiv 
Um, I do. I am going to have to pass in a circle SHA-1. It'll be fake. So let's get out of here. I'll get a vagrant. Uh, this is working in a virtual environment here. And you can see I did this last time with this A, B, C, D, E, F. In fact, I might even have the same thing going. Circle. Nope. Okay. Um, so let's export circle one as a ABC. That's enough. And you've modified our main. We should be able to run the package script. So the goal here is to see if we can bake manage that pie. Whoops. Did I not export that? Or did I, sp oh, I spelled it wrong. Blah. Circle C O. Okay. Try again. The goal here is to get manage functionality into the executable. That then we'll be able to get into the shell and check out conductor and check out where the file, the template file is, et cetera, et cetera. And if you all have any comments, please let me know. Um, uh, that's what the chat's for. Um, I've been kind of rambling on here for a while because we've been experiencing broken stuff, but maybe you're just quietly observing and that's, that's cool too. Um, if you're finding this useful or fun, um, please give me a follow or uh, subscribe on YouTube later. Um, that, that helps me uh, get some visibility to others. And I think it will increase the chance that we'll have more fun, fun discussions in the future. So that's done. Now we've got conductor abc.pyz there. And that file is already executable. That's good news. Um, you can tell you know, this one was built basically the last time I streamed quite a while ago. This one was built just now. So if I run ABC PYZ and give it manage, let's try just that, see what happens. Unknown command manage. Oh, I think it's like super confused about who it is. So I think what we've managed to do is to alias the manage.py file. So like, for example, if I put manage.py and just type in a bunch of junk. Yeah, it says the same stuff. Unknown command type manage. So that's exactly what we've done, which tells me um, that we're off. It's an off by one error. So we are passing in all of sysargv, but what we need to do is strip off or, or remove manage.py or excuse me, manage from the list of sysargs. And um, hmm. I think we should print out. Uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable that what's in sysargv is two things. Um, the first is the, the actual name. In this case, it was at the, uh, conductor ABC file and so the Django manage command must must know that like oh always skip that thing and everything after that is what you really want so we need to leave um, something in that first position and it doesn't matter 
I think what I want to do is uh, actually give everything from the first entry. I want to do a slice from everything from the first entry afterwards. And what that will effectively do when it passes it into the exec command is well, it'll really see, it'll almost be, it, imagine like it's uh, running this as the command, manage help. Um, it'll just shift everything over by one, and I think it'll give us the behavior that we want. So we're going to come over here again, and this is a slice from one, index one, to the end of the list. So hopefully that was clear enough on what's going on. We're shifting everything over, and we will package it up again. And just just so I'm super confident that it's, that it's something different, I'm going to clear out the old one. I, I have every reason to believe that it would overwrite it, but um, yeah. This, this gives me a clear break that this is something different. So we'll package up again. And the, the packaging process, if you haven't been at a previous stream, is it's it's putting everything into a particular like directory all the all the um, dependencies they're all going to uh, one particular directory and they're getting aggregated there and the conductor app itself all of that code is also being put in that directory and then it's telling shiv to package up everything in that directory and you can see that here in this line uh, where pip installing the dot is for con the conductor package and the uh, dash r requirements txt is for all of the dependencies and the important part here is this target target is a, a cool pip flag that says put all my packages in a directory or whatever directory i want it doesn't there's nothing special about this name of dist it's just the name that i picked and then when you're building the shiv app you say well this is what i want to use as as the basis for my site packages it's going to be the dist directory and I'm going to put in, you know, some some other options. So that's what's going on if you're trying to figure out, like, well, what is what is this shiv thing? Um, it's just a cleverly wrapped up zip archive with all of the site packages in, in a single place, and with a little bit of bootstrapping to know how to call this conductor main main function. Okay, so we have a new conductor ABC PYZ. We'll call it, and this time we'll do um, ABCPYZ. We'll say manage, and I'll pass in help. And hopefully, what it's doing, awesome. That's so cool. So it just it proxied for the actual manage command. Um, and even it did exactly what I, I thought it was going to do. So um, it thinks, it being Django, thinks that the thing in the first position is what I actually invoked it with of manage help. But that's that's what I was talking about, shifting. I don't know if shift that way. I don't know which way it works for the, the camera. Shifting one over um, uh, to to make this effect. So now we should be able to go manage and then type in shell. And so now we're at um, the shell for uh, conductor. And so if I import, now this is going to be interesting. I can import conductor here, but is it seeing there might be some package collision stuff here? No, good. Awesome. This is exactly what I was hoping to see. So we read the documentation, we, we read that it's extracting stuff into the .shiv directory at what we know is a unique location. Looks like the way they made that unique location is to take the package name and then give it a UUID, a universally unique identifier. Um, so the in the heat death of the universe, there will never be that identifier again. That's like kind of how unique these things are. Importantly, though, we have the path to this file. So 
we will be able to modify the template directory settings to import conductor. Uh, as I'm saying this, I'm, I'm concerned, but maybe this will be okay. Um, here's my concern. The base settings file gets loaded and I don't, I'm not sure if we can do an import of the conductor package there. We're going to, it's going to be interesting. We're going to find out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ah, boogers. We'll see. Okay. I am, I am at least confident though, that that is the right change that we want to make. And so let's uh, come back over here. Let's undo that change here. We don't actually want to change anything about the packaging script. And we've modified, oh, we should also test that G-Unicorn still works. So what happens when we pass in, when we call conductor with no parameters, it should go the other path. Okay, it's complaining about the debug toolbar uh, because that doesn't have the virtual environment. I was in the wrong, wrong terminal tab. Let's try that again. Good. Okay. So we've got both paths working. One path runs manage, one path runs unicorn, the actual web server. So the, the package is doing a little bit double duty. Maybe not great separation of concerns, but I don't want to make a separate package just to run management stuff. Um, going to run my MyPy script, see if I messed anything up. All right, so I think I'm pretty happy with this. And we'll say permit um, shiv app to run manage.py commands. Uh, let's attach it to that issue, which is 383. Four, three, three. Okay. Now, I'm doing fine. Thank you, Brian. How are you? So now the the next thing to do is. Um, Excited and nervous and a bit bothered about code stuff or just life in general. <laughs> the next step is to try and modify the settings file and make sure that we can actually do the import of the conductor package and see if that will work. Um, so let's jump over to the base settings file. And here's where I'm concerned that if this will go right or not. We want to import conductor. But I'm worried that there might be a bit of a bootstrapping problem. Oh, okay. A uni student. Well, hey, man, you got a long way to go. I've been doing this for a long time. So if what I'm saying sounds kind of like gobbledygook, like I'm, I'm here for a couple purposes. So if you have questions, please ask. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, but I, I do understand that, that this particular topic today is, uh, is maybe a bit more intense for, especially for someone who's, um, more junior in their uh, walk down doing software development. So um, we're, we're kind of up to our eyeballs and I'm, I'm sort of at my limits in, in occasions here, uh, stretching out what I know about the Python standard library and, and deep in the guts and the bowels. Um, so it, I hope it makes for something interesting and like head scratching sometimes to figure out, um, but uh, happy to walk through stuff, walk back on stuff if, if need be. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know a lot of universities are 
um, moving to Python as what they're teaching. Uh, I learned on C++ was my first language, which is not a great introduction to programming. <laughs> Um, actually, because I, I started on C++, I really did not enjoy CompSci. I, my, my major is in computer engineering, um, so I did um, electrical engineering work, and I did CS stuff, and I just, I just hated the CS stuff while I was there. So it took me like years to really get, get into it. Um, so keep at it. Uh, college was good. College was, I graduated in 2006, so um, we are in a different era, I think. <laughs> oh, good, good. Keep going to class, as long as it helps. So we're going to try doing this import from Conductor. And I'm going to try to see if this is going to blow up when we launch the shell, or if this is going to work. Um, it's complaining at me right now because it's not used, but that's OK. So manage.py shell, please don't have some circular loop. Great. Okay. So we'll come down to this templates directory area. And the important part here, notice what I'm doing. I'm, I've got the router and conductor. I want to say that this is going to be a fairly controlled change. Um, so we want the conductor package directory, which I'm just going to call conductor dir. And that's going to, we're going to use os.path.dir name. So conductor. Um, I did well in college, but like I said, I didn't do the computer science stuff uh, a ton. I like focused more on uh, the double E work. I was really, for some reason, my brain really, really clicked on doing circuit design. And I really love that stuff. But when I graduated, there just weren't job openings that I could find available. So I went to work for Lockheed Martin and did testing for them and to start and then slowly moved more into software engineering um, as time went on. So uh, getting back to this for a second, we've got this conductor dir and so os.path.dir name takes the um, or gives you the directory name of whatever file path you're giving it and if you recall the conductor file is actually pointed at the init dot py file. Um, so we what we get out of this is whatever the directory is right above that file and I set the templates the data directory right next right within that that um, conductor package file. So what we should be able to do is change this root dir stuff and delete those things and say conductor dir and I'm hoping that that will be sufficient. Yeah, it helps when you go to class um, to learn. <laughs> Sometimes. I have, I've had professors that were just so bad that it didn't actually help to go to class, but um, those were more the exception than the rule. So let's try, um, try getting out of here. And so now we're running from settings and we're going to do this two, two different ways. Just I'm, I'm curious if this is going to work differently. So we've got the shell um, from uh, Django conf import settings and settings dot templates. OK. So this is this is right to start for this version, because the where I started from here is looking at not at the uh, shiv app, um, but it's looking at the local repository. So notice here that it's got uh, the you know, where this whole code lives. That's this this part of the path, 
and then the conductor is the package and templates is the directory. So that's that's good. That's what we want. Um, okay, step two is to load this up via the shiv thing. And we want the same shell. And remember, it's using the set settings from the same directory because they're living next to each other. Um, so if I do the same thing that we did before, from Django comp import settings and say settings templates. Yeah, cool. That's, I think, that, I think we're cooking with gas because we've got this now, the more um, specific directory name. That's really good. So I think that's the change that we want to make. Um, so let's commit it. Um, we'll say modify where to look for templates. And there's a um, there's a lot of ways to structure Django applications. And there's a lot of places where you can put templates. And there are different schools of thought about how to do it. And I have advocated for putting templates in one directory for exactly a reason like this. Um, if you're making like reusable apps that that uh, like you're publishing on PyPI and uh, you want other people to use them, then you certainly have to put your own templates directory like in your own stuff. But um, if you're making your own app, like singular project, uh, I think having your templates all in one place offers this advantage of, I didn't have to do any crazy shenanigans of looping over a bunch of directories to get, get these together. It was just one directory. So that's a win, I think. Let's push this up. We're going to wait on um, CI to do its thing. It should take a couple minutes. And it will create a reminder of what's going on. So I pushed up code to GitHub. It is con kicking off a task to Circle CI. And Circle CI is um, my continuous integration service, which runs through all of the tests make sure everything is working. And if it is, we'll build one of these shiv app packages. Once it builds the shiv app package, it is then going to uh, take that file and push it to S3, to an S3 bucket that I've configured. Once all of that is done, that's like the, the front half of the front end of this, this tool chain. Once all that is done, um, we can then do a deployment and Ansible uh, as part of the deployment process will pull down this uh, this new shiv app and dump it into this apps directory that we need. Um, it will also update all the settings files that we're going to need, and I think that will help us to get to this point where we can verify. Where I want to try and end tonight is if we can do that deployment to the staging environment, uh, make sure we copy the settings over, and see if we can get as far as um, that test I wanted to do where we're doing a curl on 0.0.0, .0, .0 um, at port 8080 and if we're actually getting a response back, a, a successful response, a 200 response, not a 500. That would be the, uh, that would be the, the cherry on top tonight. So um, let's check out circle. See how it's doing. See if I made any mistakes. It's running the pipeline right now. It's packaging. <laughs> Circle, like any other company, has trouble with JavaScript. So null, null, null. I don't know what they think is going on here. Let me try logging in again. Maybe something was just messed up. Hey, Sir Dies a lot. Welcome. Thanks for joining in. We're at the tail end of getting some packaging stuff together. 
and I'm really excited to get this finished. Okay, so here's our here's the pipeline for this process. It builds some stuff, gets the dependencies, does some uh, linting. Linting is like checking for obvious mistakes that tools can find and then runs the test, which actually runs the code and, and makes sure that the code is working the way we expect it to. And then does that packaging stuff that I talked about. I'm not gonna pull up AWS tonight. Um, I, I suspect that it deployed properly. Um, we can, I guess, check that. So it put up this new file that we're going to be interested in after this is all done is 7512 blah, 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 blah. Um, that's the git shaw for this commit. Okay, so now what we need to do is get that onto the staging server. We're going to run Vagrant Provision. Vagrant Provision is just, it's hooking um, Vagrant up to the Ansible system and running my deploy steps onto the Vagrant VM. Uh, so that will, at the tail end of it, um, pull that file down from S3, put it in that directory so that we can start using it. Also, it's going to update the repository that's on there right now. Because um, remember, we've kind of hacked all this together. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, get the updated settings for that settings change that I just made. And we'll confirm that that setting is in there, but we're having a, a real test. Okay, so there's the fetch from GitHub, that's the settings. There's the app from S3. Those are the two things that we needed there. Um, I could probably kill the rest of this thing. In fact, I think I will, because um, we don't need it if it got the file. So it's going to look like an aborted um, deploy, but I don't care. So let's get back into Vagrant and go back to the serve direct serve apps directory. We one of the tasks that we haven't done yet is to make these things executable. So we need to do that first. We need to do chmod plus x on conductor seventy five stuff. And I forget that I need to do like root stuff here. There we go. Okay. So the other thing that we need to do, um, oh, let's, let's do this two ways. We can confirm old settings. Let's try and confirm the old settings um, that we haven't copied over using the new conductor with its um, new manage.managepy superpowers. So, oops, um, okay, it's using the wrong settings. That, the command I did just there, in case you're curious, is part of my deployment is I'm, I'm dumping out the production settings I need in a format that I can, for a shell, quickly get everything in a ready state, so it's setting all the proper environment variables. And so the dot is the is a shortcut for source. So the other way I could have done this was doing source dot 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 env. So that would that's loading all the variables um, in that I would need. And the reason I knew to do that is because um, by saying it's looking for debug toolbar, it means that it's in my development settings mode, which is the default. Uh, so that's that's how I got that hint to to do that. Now if I do manage the shell doesn't complain because it's looking at the the um, the Django settings module is now pointed at stage instead of the development you can see that here it's pointing at staging so running the shell is loading those settings which are different which don't expect the debug toolbar to be available um, but we can come into um, from Django comp import settings and this when we look at the templates settings on this side 
it's going to point to the old path, the hard code path, which is not what we want. Uh, and that's fine because we haven't changed the settings yet. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to nuke the settings. And I, I'm safe to do that because the, I have them available elsewhere on here. Uh, so they're gone. And um, yeah, while we're at it, I want to clean up just to, so that this test is like is in fact the test we want it to be. I want to get all this other junk out of here um, so that there is no ambiguity about what we are running. So nuke all that stuff. Now we're down to just that file. That's all that's in here. And the settings themselves I know are in serve, conductor, settings, and actually we want to do a recursive copy. We want to copy that to here. And we need to do that with sudo. So now if we list it out, we've got a settings directory and our conductor thing. Um, we bring up the shell again, and it doesn't have my history, but that's okay. From Django comp import settings. So if this is doing what we want it to this time, this should point out to that shiv directory somewhere, which it did. Great. That's good. Um, so I think I think that means that uh, when we run on zero zero zero, it will find the templates properly. That's my hope. So let's say this we we're going to bind to the the concept of binding. If you're not familiar with it, is basically stating connect my app to a particular port servers have uh, ports which are the the interface to like the outside world um, or sometimes internally and those are numbered and so we're picking a a just a commonly used port for web development which is 8080 and what we're telling g unicorn the web server is we're saying Try and listen for traffic on this port at 8080 on the broadcast address. And so Gene Unicorn is going to start up here and it's telling us it's starting up and it's listening at exactly where we told it to. Okay. So I'm uh, going to come back over here. We're going to SSH. And we'll try and bring up that curl command. Bad request. What did I do? Oh, right. So we're back to, I need to monkey with allowed hosts again. So I'm going to bring up the secrets thing for a second. Make sure that's in fact up. And I'll be with you in just a moment. The last time I had to do this, I we tweaked the settings file so that we could hack in the the zero dot zero dot zero because by default it's not wanting to do that, and that's just because I haven't hooked it all the way up into um, into its actual production configuration. So. What I'm doing is adding to that file, is it adding to the settings file to uh, allow 0.0.0, .0 to be one of the allowed hosts. Okay, and then bring you all back. Okay, so that's modified and I, I apologize I can't show that secrets file because it's got stuff in there and I'd have to rotate keys 
Um, so that's what was going on there, but it's, it's not anything really too super exciting to see. So we'll restart um, GUnicorn now. It should now it should have the, the settings that should work. Come over here and not open the secrets file. Let's do curl. Ah, dang it. Well, maybe we're making progress. I don't know. Ah, okay. We're getting we're getting down to stuff. This is good. This is progress. But we're gonna stop here tonight. But I know exactly what's going on. Part of the building. Uh, so okay, this is maybe not the best way to look at it from here. You can see it's it's saying it's missing static files. So when we ran stuff locally in the repository, the we configured static files at this directory and all of the stuff gets dumped in here and you can run a manage.py uh, command called collect static to do that but i'm pretty sure what's happening is um well i'm not totally sure but i'm it has something to do with it's just not finding the actual static files or it's not finding the uh, manifest that it expects to read that is supposed to give um, paths for this kind of stuff. Like, let's look at that error. So <clears throat> I'm using a manifest system, which is kind of like a look a gigantic lookup table. And that lookup table says, you know, the key is images twitter.png. Um, but when I ran the collect static, it is taking the content and doing an MD5 sum on it um, to fingerprint it. And that's why I can do um, set some caching information on it so that it won't expire for a very long time. But in order to get the guarantees of like not caching old stuff on somebody's browser, you need to have these fingerprints. And so uh, the collect static command run does this fingerprinting scheme where it takes the, the content of the file, calculates the MD5 sum, and then writes an output file that is something like images, Twitter, dot, whatever the MD5 sum, you know, it's going to look something like this stuff, just a bunch of characters. And um, it creates this manifest file. And the manifest file, when Django starts up, it loads all of the stuff into memory to have a gigantic lookup table. So anytime a template says, hey, give me images, Twitter, dot PNG, what it will actually do is look up in the manifest and see that, oh, images twitter.png actually maps over to images twitter .p or twitter .abcdef one two three four dot png, and then it can return that file. Um, but what's happening here is uh, we've told it to use a manifest, but it can't find the manifest. So um, there's there's missing content. So some some of the settings must still be off, um, such that it it can't find the data that it's looking for, and we're going to have to fix that. Um, but we've been going for oh geez, nearly getting close to two hours, um, and we're just not there yet. So I I, I think that's where I'm going to stop. Um, let's see what can I what can I say to to close it up. We I put all these things on YouTube, so if you want to dig into the details of or missed some part and want to come back to it. Um, I post them on YouTube on a play playlist uh, that um, is accessible somewhere. I, I have a I have a URL for my website up above. Um, there's links to it on there. There's also you can also find me on YouTube by searching for Matt Lehman, um, and there are playlists there. Uh, I put out information about this on Twitter, so you can if you miss something, you can you're welcome to follow me there. Um, if you enjoy the content tonight and um, you know you want to see more. Uh, please uh, encourage you to follow on Twitch and uh, yeah, or maybe follow on YouTube and that way you can catch them if uh, if you're not on Twitch when, when I'm on Twitch. Um, I do stream on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time and I have I will plan to stream next week as well to pick up where we left off here. I hope you found this enjoyable tonight. Um, I don't really have 
anything else to, to cover. So with that, um, yeah, I think I, I will bid you farewell. Good night.